Chad again delays a dialogue on national peace. The military government, opposition groups, and rebels were supposed to start discussions on a new constitution and holding elections. So after a year of political turmoil, what will this mean for Chad? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. It has been a year of political upheaval in Chad. The sudden death of longtime President Idris Deby last April left a power vacuum. His son, an army general, soon took over and formed a transitional military council. Mohammed Idris Deby promised a quick return to democracy, but that hasn't happened. A national dialogue with opposition groups and rebel fighters has been postponed for a second time. The talks were supposed to start next week. About 300 representatives from the military government, opposition groups, and rebel forces have been holding preliminary discussions in Qatar, but they've made little progress on constitutional reforms and holding elections. Qatar says it hopes the delay will give all sides more time to reach a peace agreement. So how did Chad get here? Rebels launched a major incursion in the north of Chad during elections last year. A day after winning the poll, President Idris Deby was killed while visiting the front lines. His son, Four-star General Mahamat Idris Deby rapidly took over in a coup. He promised to hold elections in 18 months after a national dialogue. As a precondition to join those talks, rebels demanded a general amnesty and the release of prisoners. Deby complied. In March, the government, rebels, and opposition groups began talks in Doha a month later than scheduled. Chad's stability is crucial for its neighbors. The country lies across the Sahel and beside the Horn of Africa. Its soldiers are integral to the G5 Sahel Joint Force battling armed groups in the region. All right, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Chad's capital in Jamina is Ramaji Hoinathi. He's a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies. Ovigwe Egwegu is a security analyst at the consultancy Afropolitica. He joins us from Abuja. And joining us from Barcelona is Enrica Pico. She's the director of the Central Africa Project at the International Crisis Group. A very warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Ramaji, let me start with you today. The dialogue on national peace has been delayed once again. What are the reasons for that? I think that the main reason and the official one we know from now is uh, a demand from the, the Qatar uh, asking the Chadian government to postpone the holding of the dialogue on the 10th of May as uh, planned. And uh, this demand also normally came from a demand already uh, made by the different rebel groups that are also sitting uh, in Doha, Qatar, discussing actually with uh, the transitional government. And uh, this came as a result uh, of the fact that the debates in Doha are not really moving forward. And uh, people sitting actually in Doha are far uh, from a peace um, agreement uh, that could allow then a ceasefire and then coming to the national inclusive dialogue that mm. uh, is supposed to start here in the 10th of May. So uh, here are the, the main reasons for that. Uh, Enrica, after a year of such political turmoil, what does this delay mean for Chad? Well, the main consequence of the uh, of the delay uh, is the impact uh, on the overall uh, transition. Uh, the 18 months uh, transition was supposed to end uh, uh, this year, by the end of this year, uh, with the celebration of uh, uh, election uh, and the uh, establishment uh, of elected uh, of new elected authorities. So uh, this uh, uh, my rise concern about the length of the transition, about the duration of the transition, and uh, the legitimacy of uh, the Chadian authorities uh, that. Uh, uh, have taken power uh, after the uh, death of uh, um, former president, late president Deby. Ovigwe, um, the discussions that have been going on thus far in Qatar, how, how have they been going? Yeah, I think one of the things you have to understand with regards to the Doha talk is that the issues are very complex and they are very long standing. Because the the problem that dealing in Chad with today is not just it didn't just start after the death of former President Deby. Even while the former President Deby was in office, 
they were very, they were groups who were very dissatisfied with, with, with the government, the rebel groups, opposition party uh, members because of how he has led uh, or how he led the country at the time. So these are very long-standing issues, and it, it, it's uh, a bit uh, too optimistic to expect that within 18 months you could agree or you could even start uh, a very solid uh, uh, conversation and end, and, end, and end the conversation with maybe the end of a declaration to say, OK, now we can move on to national dialogue. So I think one of, one of the most important things we have to recognize is it will take a period of time, a good amount of time, to actually trash these issues one after the other because they are, like I said, you know, it, it cuts across all of Chadian societies, whether it's within, you know, re uh, political reforms or is even these questions about the state itself and also, you know, uh, territorial issues and ethnic issues. So it's it's quite a bit that they have on their plate. And I and I, I, did, I didn't really look at the timeline as very pragmatic given the complexity of the issues. Uh, Ovigwe, you know, you were just talking about how complicated all these issues are and, and how far they go back. Were you surprised uh, uh, that that the delay happened, uh, that these delays have happened, or were you expecting them? Honestly, I was ex I was expecting them. And if you look at comments coming from one of the Af one of the African diplomats who was actually, who was actually observing the talks, he is actually not not surprised at, as well. And and that is because yes, um, for instance, if we if you look, the government the government or the traditional government in Chad is very uh, open to, to to the process, commits to the process. And if, if you see the, when the, the uh, Front for Change and Concord in Chad said they wanted, you know, the government to grant amnesty as a precondition for the, for the talks, the government did back, back in November grant amnesty to 296, you know, uh, combatants you know, from, from the group. So there is a commitment from the government side. But if you look at the rebel side, the issues are, that is where it things begin to get very complicated because you have, you know, uh, demand going things like the uh, uh, Mama Debbie shouldn't stand for re-election or return of seized assets, and the government itself, you know, has power to to uh, give make these concessions. But you have to also reconcile the competing uh, uh, rivalries within, even between the the uh, opposition and rebel movement, because while they might be forming a unified position, you have about 40 groups present in in the process in Doha. Between the, the members making up this group, there are very strong divisions and there are mm -hmm. very strong issues that divide them. And you have to reconcile all of this because if you just move, if you rush the process, what you have is, is, a, is a, a, a declaration like, or an agreement that is just valid on paper. And then these groups are not going to hold on to mm -hmm. those agreements going forward when the national dialogue really you know, gets underway. Uh, Enrica, I saw you nodding along to some of what Ovigwe was saying. Did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, uh, I was, um, I was just uh, um, on the same line. Uh, uh, we are on the same line on the fact that uh, uh, there is a general consensus uh, in uh, uh, Chad on the fact that uh, the uh, dialogue cannot be done without uh, the presence in Jamena of the main, of the leaders of the main armed group. So uh, there is some uh, tolerance in terms of uh, delay, but uh, the delay now they're starting to get. Uh, uh, more and more frequent. Uh, the dialogue was supposed to be, the national dialogue in Germany was supposed to be held at the end of the last year, then in January, then has been postponed again. So uh, this uh, uh, starts uh, becoming a, an issue also in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, also for, uh, for what uh, it concerned the revision of the constitutional chart of the transitional constitution. Uh, this was one of the first uh, um, one of the first uh, engagement and condition mm -hmm. also um, uh, imposed by the uh, African Union uh, after the uh, the uh, establishment of the uh, military transitional authorities. The fact that uh, uh, those authorities cannot uh, run for election at the end of the transition and the revision of the of the constitution is one of the key points that should be discussed during the uh, national dialogue in uh, in Jamena. So all those issues uh, um, are uh, still uh, mm -hmm. um, are still uh, um, uh, open and uh, my. Uh, uh, became uh, um, I became uh, sensitive after uh, almost uh, yeah one year after uh, the the death of uh, uh, Idris Deby, President Deby. Ramaji, you wrote a piece in March in which you said 
The partners supporting the country's transition, dialogue, and reconciliation processes should be firmer on the need to respect the timeframes and ensure inclusiveness so that no stakeholder is left on the sidelines. A stalemate on these issues could see Chad slide back into political instability. So how concerned are you at this time that instability could continue and grow? Uh, yeah, I'm, as the other observers, I'm really uh, concerned uh, by the fact that if we don't reach any peace agreement in Doha, uh, it means that even though uh, a national dialogue is wholly meaning that most of the biggest rebel groups are out of the deal, it means that they could still uh, be able of uh, rendering the country unstable. Uh, so it's something very important uh, coming to a peace agreement in Doha. But what actually you know is kind of making the any hope of uh, peace agreement fading in doha is even the composition of the different groups that are actually sitting at the table uh, the rebel groups are so fragmented as my colleague said and so uh, how could we come to a peace agreement if the division is not just uh, between the government and the different groups that are speaking but also within all the groups that are sitting to the table so uh, for me uh, we are facing uh, two situations, actually. Uh, the first is that there is no more visibility on when uh, the, the dialogue, national dialogue will happen. There is even no uh, visibility on which would be the issue, the real issue of Doha. And then uh, after that, we are then questioning, you know, when uh, should the, 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 the transitional period end with the elections? And actually then uh, the initial 18 uh, months that have been planned are actually uh, insufficient, uh, finishing the discussions in Doha, uh, then holding the national dialogue and going to uh, elections. And there is something that people are not considering when discussing, you know, about the coming dialogue. There, we are too much stressing uh, on the dialogue discussion with the rebel groups, but at the same time, uh, there is something very important. There are a lot of dynamics in the country, actually, that also needed to be addressed. And uh, those dynamics are linked to uh, intercommunal conflict, uh, to corruption, and to a lot of other problems. And so if all this is not uh, solved, then uh, there will be still questions uh, about the inclusiveness of that dialogue. You know, uh, having peace with uh, rebel groups, it's something, but then having social peace within the country, uh, to mean with uh, uh, political stakeholders, civil society, etc., is also something that is very important, but that actually is unforeseen by most of the actors discussing, you know, about the future of the country. Ovigne, just how crucial is Chad's stability for its neighbors? And, and how concerned are Chad's neighbors at this time because of what's going on? Um, Chad plays a very, very key role in terms of uh, regional security, uh, given the fact that if you look at uh, the issue of you know, Boko Haram, for instance, and an ISWAP, you know, the Chadian army has played a very you know, strategic role in, in pushing back and even strangling, strangling Boko Haram in particular in the, in the you know, heat of the, of the you know, war in mid-2010s uh, and, and even to up, to, uh, up to very recently, the Chadian army was very, very... Uh, was very very pivotal in crushing uh, Boko Haram. You could, you would even say one of one of the most important things uh, people used to look forward to was uh, the the presence of uh, former President Debi actually going you know going to the war front uh, to actually face the, the, the combat group uh, the, the combatants from uh, Boko Haram. So uh, Chad not only serves that uh, very important military role. But also, uh, it's a good logistics hub uh, for uh, international uh, security partners for for all of, all of the countries. You know, Chad Minik also a key member of the multinational uh, joint task force with Nigeria, uh, Came uh, Cameroon, uh, and and all of all of that. So it plays a very important role militarily for the issue of, of Boko Haram, and also even in, in addressing the uh, you know uh, not uh, the environmental issues even within within uh, the, the region. So there's a Lake Chad Basin Commission. And of course, the headquarters is, is in, in Jamena, and they work together, you know, in coordinating, coordinating with Nigeria, Cameroon, even Niger, to see how they can address, you know, uh, food security issues in in the Lake Chad because of the shrinking of the Lake Chad has been going on for decades now. Mm -hmm. And if, there's recognition that if you, if you don't address the issue of food security, farming, farmer cattle, uh, uh, farmer and uh, cattle header uh, crisis. You know, we will not be able to solve some of the most uh, 
important drivers of, of the conflict mm -hmm. because it's not just terrorism, terrorism, they are, they are systemic or they are even environmental factors to this. And Chad plays a very, very important role in all, in all, of, in all of the uh, measures that in regional countries are taking. So, if you, and even if you see uh, President uh, Debbie, Debbie's mm -hmm. outreach to, to uh, regional countries, recently it was in Nigeria, it was in Nigeria also mm -hmm. la last year, visiting President Buhari, and the issue of cooperation, you know, the multilateral, multinational, uh, multinational joint task force, greater coordination. So it's uh -huh. it's a very important country for regional, regional security, and that is why leaders and analysts across the region are watching uh -huh. very closely what is happening because we believe if Chad can gain more stability and more, you know, more political stability rather, and it will become even, even a better position to mm -hmm. support regional security efforts. Enrica, if Chad does continue to slide into instability, what does that mean for security and for the battle against insurgency in the Horn of Africa? Well, uh, the stability of Chad uh, is uh, a key issue for, uh, for the entire uh, region, uh, not only, as uh, my colleague said, uh, for the fight against uh, jihadism and Boko Haram, but uh, also uh, for, the, for the rest of the, of the uh, neighboring country. I'm thinking about uh, uh, Sudan, for instance, the violence uh, in, uh, in Darfur, in, uh, in Jenina, uh, are uh, um, rising, the level of violence is rising, and most of the violence are committed by uh, Arab uh, militia. So uh, the conflict might uh, uh, easily uh, cross the border in, uh, into Chad. In uh, uh, looking at the southern border, border, also the situation with the Central African Republic has been tense in the past year and might uh, become tense again, uh, especially after the uh, incursion of uh, Russian mercenaries into Chadian soil last year in May and then in uh, September. So this is also something that uh, the uh, authorities in Jamena are monitoring, uh, are monitoring closely because uh, uh, might be, might, uh, be factors destabilizing the uh, situation uh, in the country. And uh, an unstable Chad mm -hmm. uh, might contribute to the destabilization of the region uh, on the other way around, because uh, uh, most, of, for instance, uh, of the uh, Central African rebels are currently uh, in Chad along the southern border mm -hmm. uh, in the main, main th same thing for, uh, uh, for Sudan. The eastern border is uh, uh, might be uh, the, um, the safe haven for uh, Sudanese uh, militias, and uh, uh, as my colleague said, for uh, for Boko Haram. So the stability of Chad uh, is uh, key. Most of the Western partners are also well determined in uh, maintaining this uh, uh, stability. But uh, of course, uh, the uh, fact that uh, uh, legitimate authorities, uh, uh, the, the, the election of legitimate uh, authorities mm -hmm. in a reasonable, reasonable uh, period of time uh, is one of the key uh, conditions. Uh, there are many transitions uh, ongoing uh, in, uh, in the region, especially in uh, West Africa and the Sahel. So uh, the Chadian one is not uh, the only one, but uh, it can, uh, for the moment, was one of the models, uh, mm -hmm. one of the references also for the transition. So we will have to see if this continues to be the case. Mm. Uh, Ramaji, um, I know we touched on this earlier in the conversation, but uh, the amnesty law that was designed to draw armed groups into the transition process, does that exclude some entities? Uh, I think that globally uh, the, the amnesty law actually is not really excluding um, the, the, the biggest group that are concerned because even the, the fact that have been included in the fight where the president Debbie uh, founded uh, is not excluded from the from this amnesty. Uh, so globally, that's it. But uh, uh, and that's also the principle. But how this amnesty will be played down uh, concretely on the ground? Uh, I think that this is also one of the unsaid reasons for which uh, some of the main rebel groups leaders are also not very keen. Uh, actually, uh, stopping the discussions in, the, in Doha and then uh, heading to Germany for the, the national uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, so I think, yeah, in principle, there is a kind of large amnesty, but the way this amnesty might be played down uh, is also one of the fears for some of the, the main rebel groups, including mainly uh, someone like Mahdi, uh, the head of the fact. Ovigwe, the Front for Change and Concord in Chad is demanding amnesty for all of its fighters. Is that an issue that can be resolved? That would be a very, very uh, difficult issue uh, because, like I said earlier, the, you know, the government, the traditional government, will give amnesty 
you know, to so 296 people as a precondition for the talk. So that shows it is ready to do that. But we have to understand that this particular rebel group is responsible, you know, or at least in part, for the death of former President Debbie. Now, his son is in power. Whether or not he's the leader of the country, any son who knows the, the circumstances under his father's death that, and, and has power to do something would definitely want to exercise that power. So I think it will be very... It would be very, very difficult for you know for uh, uh, current uh, uh, President Debbie to actually you know grant a full, comprehensive or broad range uh, amnesty for all of uh, all of uh, fact because it, it's uh, it's a very it's a personal issue uh, for him as, as much as it is about uh, the national you know reconciliation and all of that. So uh, maybe he might then use that as a concession to get extra concession on the issue of him not being uh, allowed to run for for the election. So. It's all politics, but at the same time, it's still personal. But because I think him, him as a leader, having you know, stepped into his father's shoes, you know, a, a child is not in his best place, but he would argue, and even looking at the history of attacks and how the country has been running, it seems business as usual. Uh, but that, to to some extent, is you know, it shows he has some capacity. So he would argue that he has capacity to continue to run the country, and then if if the uh, if the front for change and concord is is really insistent on getting comprehensive and wide amnesty, then it might push them to actually support his position on being able to be reelected. Because, like I said, it's a very it's a very personal issue for him, and that might that might not be you know, entirely possible. Uh, Enrica, from talking to you and Ovigwe and Ramaji, uh, this all sounds like an extremely complicated process. Uh, some might say that perhaps it's irreconcilable. I want to ask you, are there some immediate steps that could be taken in order for the groundwork to be laid for reconciliation among all Chadians? Well, uh, the transitional, uh, the military the transitional authorities uh, uh, have uh, done something that, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, on, uh, at least for what has been seen uh, so far, uh, uh, was not that usual uh, in Chad uh, till, uh, till last year. Opening the political space uh, to opposition leader, to civil society organization. What can be, uh, what are still to be done is that this uh, political uh, openness is not, uh, not be only on paper, not only uh, uh, transitional during this uh, difficult months, but uh, will actually change the political uh, scene in uh, Jamaica and that uh, uh, the re and that the um, current uh, um, uh, elite running the country will actually uh, effectively open uh, the uh, political scene to other parties and to the political forces. It will uh, would radically change the uh, situation uh, in the next future. And then, as mentioned before, I think uh, it's uh, important to keep the uh, engagement. Uh, that uh, were uh, settled at the beginning of the transition, mainly to revise the uh, constitutional uh, uh, chart, the transitional constitution, uh, and uh, uh, to um, include the ineligibility for the current uh, transitional authorities for uh, the upcoming uh, election. Uh, something that uh, can also be done in terms of uh, um, uh, of uh, calming down the uh, emerging uh, uh, ethnic uh, and intercommunal uh, tension in different parts of the of the countries, as uh, uh, my colleague Ramaji uh, said, uh, is uh, uh, also to include and to make this dialogue uh, uh, the most inclusive possible in terms of uh, community from uh, all around the country. So uh, not giving the uh, impression that the dialogue is again uh, something uh, within the elite of the country and that uh, in any case uh, the, 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 the situation uh, will not, uh, the situation in terms of uh, uh, governing uh, uh, the, the country will not change, but uh, including as much as possible different communities, mm -hmm. making them part of the of the process, and actually give uh, mm -hmm. uh, space uh, during the, the national dialogue for the discussion about uh, uh, about land, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, uh, different community tension, about uh, uh, governance, about corruption, uh, and about uh, all the other right. problems that have not been put uh, in standby during this uh, uh, transition and during the dialogue in Doha. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Ramaji Hoinati, Ovigwe Egwegu, and Enrica Pico.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.